In this video, we'll look at the process for calculating the Kretschmann scalar in detail with two familiar cases, the two-sphere and the Schwarzschild geometry. Now, this video will show that the curvature of the Schwarzschild geometry is accurately described using the Riemann tensor and not the contracted Ricci tensor. Now, we can use the Kretschmann scalar K to locate real physical singularities, as opposed to those that result from a given choice of coordinates. Now this scalar is coordinate invariant, meaning that if, if it is finite in any one coordinate system, then it is finite in all coordinate systems. So our Kretschmann scalar is given by this object here. Now for the Schwarzschild geometry, it is this object here. Now I should just point out this sentence up here. What we're saying is if it's non-zero in one coordinate system, then it's non-zero in all coordinate systems. So the full, uh, Schwarzschild geometry, we'll see that towards the end of the video, it's this value here. And we notice that it remains finite, the Schwarzschild radius. Rs is 2gm on c squared and has a singularity at i equals zero. And the Schwarzschild coordinates, the metric looks like it has a singularity at the Schwarzschild radius here. But that's just due to the choice of coordinates. And this Kretschmann scalar here points that out that the curvature is still finite at the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, when you substitute this value into here, you find this is a finite value and it doesn't become infinite as the metric blows up at that point, suggesting that there's some sort of singularity there, which isn't. It's simply the choice of the coordinates. Now that's in all the other videos I've got on the Schwarzschild uh, geometry, so have a look at those. Now let's begin by using the Kretschmann scalar to determine the curvature of the familiar two-sphere. Right, now I've made a video in the past in which I've used the contracted Ricci tensor, the Ricci curvature scalar, to find the um, uh, curvature of a two-sphere, so you can have a look at that. But let's just briefly retrace what we need. So, okay, so here's our coordinate system, phi and theta. Phi is our first coordinate, theta our second. And for a two-sphere of fixed radius, you have these coordinates. X is A sine phi cos theta, phi and theta here. Uh, y is a sine phi sine theta, and z is a cos phi. All right, now, an arbitrary point on the surface of this, of this sphere is given by the position vector here. So this sphere embedded in three-dimensional Euclidean space, and here's the position vector for any point on that sphere. Now, we want basis vectors in on the surface of the sphere and the two space, that is, the, that is our manifold, our, the surface of the sphere. So we need um, two basis vectors, it's a two-dimensional surface. E theta is the partial derivative of the position vector r with respect to theta, it's this object. E phi is dr d phi, it's this object here. Our metric tensor is defined as gab is ea dot eb, <clears throat> this object here, which gives us this when we carry out the calculations, and I've shown you that in a previous video <clears throat> on applications of the Riemann tensor and elsewhere. All right, now the Christoffel symbols are found by DEA, DXB is gamma C, A, B, E, C, and this gives us our Christoffel symbols. Now in two dimensions, there's a single independent component of the Riemann tensor, and this particular formula is in one of the other videos on the symmetry properties of the Riemann tensor. We have one independent component. That component is this object here. <coughs> Is one, and we can lower the first index using the metric to give us this object here. All right, now the symmetry properties of Riemann tensor are given by these here. Take notice, these are going to be important throughout this video here. So, R, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. What we can do is swap the first pair and the second pair, so we get gamma, delta, alpha, beta. Now that remains positive. And what we can do is beta, alpha, uh, delta, gamma, just swapping the indices within each pair gives us po positive uh, component. But then we get these two negative components here, and they come from swapping the indices within the first pair, but not the second, or within the second pair, but not the first. <coughs> when we do that for the two sphere, we find we started with this object here, but from the symmetry properties, we generate another three components. So altogether, we're going to have four components. And that's four non-zero components given to us by the symmetry properties. So here are all the 
zero components on the Riemann tensor for the two sphere. Now we can raise indices using the inverse metric terms. Now our metric was a diagonal one. So the inverse metric will just be made up of uh, the reciprocal of the terms um, by, so, so we simply take the reciprocal of the diagonal terms and that gives us the inverse metric. And these upper indices indicate those terms. And when we do that, we're multiplying by each of these here. And when we do that, we get this object here. And that's for the first one. And we can do the same for each of these three here. And when we do that, we're going to produce this object here, and some of them will be negative. All right. Now, so we have the Riemann components with all the indices up, and you've already seen the Riemann uh, uh, components with the, all the indices down. So we can form the following products. This one, which gives us this, and this one. So there's four of them, four of these products. Here we go, this one. This one as well and this one. Now the next step is to calculate the Kretschmann scalar, which will give us the curvature of our object. Now, by definition, the Kretschmann scalar is this. So what we can do is we're going to do it the long way now because it's easy enough for the two sphere to do. And we're going to start with the last index there, delta, delta, and we're going to expand that. So in our case, we have phi and phi and theta and theta. Now for each one of these, we're going to expand the gamma next. So that'll be phi, phi, theta, theta, over here, phi, phi, theta, theta, and then next one down for each one of these four here, we're going to expand that out, so phi, phi, theta, theta, phi, phi, theta, theta, phi, phi, theta, theta, and so on like that. And then each one of these for the remaining index alpha, each one of these will have two uh, components when we expand them out, so phi, phi, theta, theta, and we expand them all out, so it gives us 16 of them, 4, 4, 4, and 4, 16 of them. However, <clears throat> only 4 of them are non-zero, and so all the others drop out. And that's an indicator, a handy indicator of what we'll do in higher dimensional cases. So here are the 4 non-zero ones, and each of them has this value, 1 on a to the 4. Remember, it's the fixed radius of the sphere, and when we... Add those together, we get 4 on a to the power of 4. All right, so the Kretschmann scalar for the two sphere is this object here, is r squared. Remember, each of these indices sum out, so we're left with r squared is 4 on a to the 4. Sphere has positive curvature, so we're going to take the positive square root of that, so it's 2 on a squared. So the radius of curvature, the Ricci scalar, radius of curvature, well, sorry, the curvature scalar, sorry, Curvature scalar 2 on a squared is this object here, which is what we found in a previous video on curvature. But this time we found it with the Kretschmann scalar. So now let's calculate the Kretschmann scalar for the Schwarzschild geometry using the coordinate CTR theta phi and with the spatial part model by phi theta r. So polar angle as a methyl angle. Here are our coordinates. Okay in Cartesian coordinates x, y, z, so embedding that in three-dimensional Euclidean space, but don't forget we also have the time. Anyway, so we find out that the Schwarzschild metric is this object here. All right, now for ease of calculation, I'm going to use the following equivalents. Instead of writing C, T, R, theta, phi, I'm going to write 1, 2, 3, 4. It's much easier to look at, it's much easier on the eye. All right, just reminding ourselves of the symmetry properties of Riemann tensor again. So here we can swap the pairs. Alpha, beta can go last and gamma, delta can go first. Yep. And then we can do uh, swap the indices within each pair. So alpha and beta swap places become beta, alpha, and gamma, delta swap places become delta, gamma. Now they're all positive. And then the negative ones result by picking a pair and swapping the indices within it and not the other pair. So Alpha, beta are swapped, beta, alpha, and that makes a negative component. And same, same over here with the last pair. Gamma, delta becomes delta, gamma gives us a negative. <clears throat> now, the non-zero components of the Riemann tensor in the Schwarzschild geometry can be generated from the following six terms using symmetry relations. 
Uh, so what I did here is I used a software package to find the non-zero uh, components, and then from those you find the ones that can, from which all the others can be generated. So in the end, we have 24 non-zero components. Uh, I might just point out here that there are, in four dimensions, there are 20 independent components. I'm finding here there's 24 non-zero ones, so a different thing. Symmetry property again, just to remind ourselves, here it is. They're very important. <clears throat> and as you can guess from each one of these, we'll generate four altogether four components of which these will be one. You'll see that in a moment. All right, so uh, one, two, two, one, here we go. Now by the symmetry properties, swapping these around, we'll give us a negative here, swap around, positive, negative here. We can use the inverse metric because it's a diagonal metric, the Schwarzschild metric is a diagonal metric, so we can, the inverse metric is simply each of the terms becomes the reciprocal, so G11 is the reciprocal of G lower 11 and so on, and so we can raise the indices here. And so one, two, two, one in the lower position, if we raise all four indices using the inverse metric components, we get produced this Riemann component here with all indices raised. To do that, G11 is this, G22, G22, G11, and here R1221, this one here, Okay, when we multiply that, we actually find uh, <coughs> this and this cancel, this and this cancel, we just end up with what we started with. So <clears throat> R1221 with all indices raised is this object here. And then by the symmetry properties, we can see that there's another three non-zero components involving this. And these indices moved here. The one and the two swap place, the two and the one swap place. So this is a positive one and then we're left with these two negative ones here. We're gonna keep going in the same manner. So for the next one, R1331, all in the lower place, is this object here. By the symmetry properties, we have these. By uh, raising the indices using the inverse metric, we have this object here. When we multiply that out, we end up with this. By the symmetry properties, again, we see there's only three non-zero versions of this, two of which are negative. Next bit, R1441, same thing here again. There's four non-zero versions of this. All the same, except for a plus or a minus sign in front. We can raise these lower indices, all of them, same way, inverse metric, object here, and don't forget we have another three of non-zero versions of this. All the same as this, but just differing only with it in terms of a plus or a minus sign in front. Next bit. For the others, just speeding the process up a bit. Here we go. This one, this one, and this one. Next step, we can then form products. And we only need to do this for six of for our original six cases, bearing in mind there's going to be four altogether. There's another three of these, another three of these, another three of these, another three of those, and so on and so on. But let's just start with this one. So we get, when we multiply that together, we get that object, form this product, we get this object, form this product, and we're going to get this object. You can see it's that multiplied by that gives us this. This product here can be formed, so this multiplied by that gives us this. This one multiplied by that one gives us this, and this product here, this one multiplied by this one gives us this one. And don't forget for each one of these, there's another three non-zero versions of this. All right? And they'll all turn out to be positive in this case. Now, the Kretschmann scale are coming back here again. Now, instead of writing out all 256 terms, which would fill pages here of this on this video, we only need the non-zero ones. And then we multiply them by four because there's four of them. So there's four of this, four of this, four of this, four of this, four of that, four of that. All right. When we do that, let's substitute in here this, 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 and this. We found on the previous slide. Multiply by four. When we do that, we get the familiar value for the Kretschmann scalar for the Schwarzschild geometry, which is this value here. Now, this Kretschmann scalar for the Schwarzschild geometry is given by this. 
Here we go. Now the Schwarz Child solution is obtained by setting the Ricci tensor to zero in the region outside some given mass, which is the source of the Schwarz Child geometry. And it is what gives you the um, geometry in the region outside this mass. So by solving the Ricci tensor set equal to zero, this is how we derive the metric um, to describe the region outside the mass. Now the contraction of the Ricci tensor gives the Ricci scalar. So that's uh, using inverse metric here. But we find that if the Ricci tensor is zero in the region described by the metric, then the Ricci scalar must be zero as well. Now that implies there's no curvature of the space time in the region beyond the Schwarzschild radius, which is clearly not true. You can't say that outside a Schwarzschild black hole there's no curvature in the space time outside it. Of course there is. And so this is where the Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar are not the appropriate ones to use for the curvature uh, for that region there. This is where the Kretschmann scalar is the appropriate one to use. It's the Riemann tensor which gives you the curvature of the space, not necessarily the Ricci scalar. All right, so a manifold space-time is flat if the Riemann tensor vanishes everywhere and so it is the Kretschmann scalar that is the right one to use to quantify curvature, not the Ricci scalar. It's the Riemann tensor which contains the information about the curvature of the space in question. All right, that's it then.